and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much. I, I am really glad to see all of these teachers here and the principals and the leaders of schools. And I fully, fully agree with my previous colleagues. Uh, innovation is about not resources, but resourcefulness. And that's the most important thing. If you get a lot of resourceful people in a school, you can create innovation. But it doesn't matter how much resources you put in. If the people are not resourceful, you are not going to do anything with it. What I think many of you have listened to Dr. Abdullah yesterday, Abdullah Al Karam, who was the head of KHDA. I come from KHDA, and at KHDA, we basically regulate the private education system in Dubai. So just like you are concerned about the micro level, what happens in the classroom, we are also concerned about the macro level. Because activities are one thing, but the outcome is something else. Because all of the activities that happens in a classroom, all the teaching that takes place, everything, it is not about giving somebody a knowledge of a subject which is unfortunately what's happening most of the time. People are concerned about content. At the end, there has to be an, an outcome. What will this learner, the one that we have spent 10 years or 12 years nurturing and investing in, what will they be able to do? What are they capable of? Are they going to be the citizens that we look for? Are they going to be the productive people that we look for? Are they going to be the innovative people that we look for? Are they going to be the productive people that we look for? It's not about learning a bit of math or a bit of science or a bit of geography. It's not about, and unfortunately, this is what most of the time, educators, they focus on developing people to go into universities. So what is the percentage of people that go into university? It's very, very small. So we seem to be putting all of our efforts to prepare people to go to universities when most of the people, they don't go to universities, they go and they do something else. So it's getting the priorities right. So for us, we look after the education, the private education in Dubai. Uh, I'm supposed to point somewhere. I don't know, point there, point here, point it myself. I, I'm not sure. You know, so anyway, it worked. So, so basically, in Dubai, we have close to 185 schools. We are growing by 10 schools a year. At the moment, actually, we are 195 schools. We are going to grow by 10 schools a year over the next 10 years. So we'll have an additional 120 schools. At the moment, I've got close to 274,000 students in Dubai schools. I have got roughly 19,000 teachers with an annual growth of 8 to 10 percent. But there is also a chain rate because many, there are a significant number of teachers in Dubai that are on transition. So every year we get people, they move on to other countries or teacher or they can go back home. So they are not part of the growth, but they are part of the chain rate. So this is happening. So with a landscape like this, where we have got not a single curriculum that we can think about. Most countries, they have got a single curriculum, at most two, and then they can pay attention to them in order to raise the expectation. When we look at the education system in Dubai, our focus is not just on Emiratis. Our focus is on everybody, because we think that everybody that lands in Dubai potentially they are capable of contributing to Dubai one day. We aim to retain them rather than for them to go home or to go to another country and do something else. So our aim is the best workers of the future for us, the best people that are going to develop Dubai in the future are the people that have been raised in Dubai, educated in Dubai, and they receive what they have. So for us, we look at the micro level and we say, okay, so what is the current status of these schools? When we look at the number of schools that have been inspected last year, there is close to 38, 39% of schools that are weak and acceptable. And the key thing for us is acceptable is no longer acceptable. 
This is not the ambition for the people that learn in Dubai. Our ambition, we want every child to go to a good school or better, because acceptable is no longer acceptable. And this is our attitude. This is the way that we set the challenge. So the challenge is for the whole of society to think like that. Acceptable school, some of these good and very good schools, they are also affordable schools. They are not expensive ones. It's not about resources. It's about the resourcefulness of the people that runs them. When I look and I see that 36% of students in Dubai, they are going to acceptable and below school, it means these kids are getting a raw deal. And we have got to work to make sure that these kids are, are going to have access to good, very good, and outstanding schools. So we want to flip it around. Rather than seeing a lot of people in acceptable school, these 40%, we want to raise them up a little bit. What else do we want? We also want to see that the outcome of these students coming out from school, whether they're exams in pizza or in Thames, we wanted to see it on the rise because we want to be in the top 15 or 20 countries in the world. So the outcome is very important for us. It's not just what's happening, because a lot of the people, they focus on the process. They focus on what's going on, rather than they focus on what will be the outcome of this, what will be the output. So, and as you can see, over the last 10 years, Dubai has been rising in this. And thanks to I don't want to disrupt you, so I'll wait until you finish. Okay, so what we are trying to do, we are trying to see this level rise so that our average is above 520, okay? Although that we can see some schools are doing very well and some curriculums, they are doing, uh, oh, okay. Some schools are doing very well and some curriculums are doing quite well uh, can I see the red spot? No, I cannot see the red spot. Okay. So, you can see the UK curriculum, the IB curriculum, the Indian curriculum. They are doing quite good for us, and they are hitting the 500 marker. But some other curriculums are not helping along. These are not necessarily, all the others are not necessarily all just, you know, weak schools or acceptable schools. There are some good schools that are not performing as well as what we want them to do. When we look at the Thames, and again, we can see that we are going up and we are getting better because unless we improve the Thames scores, the PISA scores are not going to improve because it's a pipeline. If people are weak at the foundation, there is nothing you can do later on that is going to change them drastically. So you have got to work across all stages rather than concentrating on the secondary stage thinking that miracles are going to happen. Miracles, they don't happen at the secondary stage. You have got to start in the primary and the middle school if you really want to change things at the secondary schools. And because KHDA have been around for 10 years, I think over the next four to five years, we will see how well KHDA has done because those people that they were in year one when we started, and in year two, these are the people that are coming up now, and we will see how they will change the scene dramatically and significantly. So we have a lot of challenge, of course, in here. We have got challenges, the private education landscape, by nature, private education, it is for profit, so it is partly it's a business, partly it's education business, and how to get this right balance between the two, between the public good and for profit. So how to get this right. We have 46% of Emirati students, they are in acceptable and weak schools. And again, this is no longer acceptable. And I think many of you, you have read in the news, the initiative of His Highness is that by the year 2021, there will be no Emirati school, no Emirati students in acceptable and weak schools. So what to do? either not allow schools to take uh, acceptable and weak school to take Emiratis. So that's one way. And the other way, there's too much echo here. And the other way is to make sure 
or the other way is to make sure that there are simply no weak and acceptable schools. So, and of course, the third way is to work across both paths. We have got uh, raising the achievement okay, of our low performing schools. That's very important for us. So we, we want them to move up. And our experience, if we want a school to move up, it's not going to happen by a magic wand or by a miracle. You really have got to work very hard with the very people who run the schools and the people who are operating in the school, the teachers, basically. So leadership, number one. Number two, it has got to be the school themselves. So what do we want? We have a national agenda. And by the year 2021, we want the students that finish secondary school, they will no longer need a transition year or a, a year you know, to, to repeat what they have done before. We want to be in the top uh, 15 countries with TEMS. We want to be within the top 20 countries with PISA. Okay? And we want, to, we want to narrow the gap of, the gap of achievement between Emiratis and then Emiratis. Emiratis are going to be leading this country in the future. So we have to give them a good deal right now. So one of the enablers that we have, we have, we said, you really have got to work with the very people that are providing the education. Good education is not just about technology or about having better schools or more gardens and more football fields and bigger classrooms and all of these concepts about different classrooms. Many concepts that people will read about and you will read about them in education journals and so on, you always got to stop and think, are they scalable? It's good to hear about a concept, a little experiment that happened somewhere around the world. But can you actually scale this up so that it will reach everyone? Very difficult to scale a lot of ideas. There are some very good ideas that go around. But once you think about giving the opportunity to every child in the classroom to do this, you'll say, we cannot do it. It's like, you know, should the students, they take work experience before they graduate from school? Yeah, a lot of people say it's a very good idea. But it's very challenging to guarantee that everybody is going to get that work experience. Or at least they will get a viable, okay, work experience. They can go there and make teas and coffee. But to get a viable work experience, that's almost impossible. So this is the problem of scalability. There is no shortage of good ideas. But where we have the problem is getting a very sound idea that is scalable right all the way across, okay? So our focus, so the scalability where we are thinking about, we are thinking about how, do, how to maintain a minimum level of teachers, a minimum level of school leadership, because the school leadership is one of the most important factors that makes or break the school, okay? So, oh, it's running uh, by itself, I think. What's going on? Okay. So. Yeah? Okay. So, how are we getting there? So, between now and 2021, as you have heard in this year, as I think today is what works with KHDA also, we have so many different initiatives that are making the building blocks of going to the year 2021. Again, there is no magic wand here. So all of these initiatives, they have got to be long-term, they have got to be sustainable, we have got to work on them one at a time, sometimes two, three in parallel. We have got to do all of these things. So we have got so many different initiatives going on at the same time. The two initiatives I will talk about today is going to be the teacher licensing and leadership licensing. Why do I need a license aside from its being a, a national target and the national target wants everybody to be licensed and so on? We have a particular problem. If you go to a place like India and you look at the teachers in India, 99.99999% are Indian. And where did they graduate from? Colleges and universities in India. Same thing for the Philippines, same thing for the UK, same thing for Germany, same thing for France. Here is a different scene altogether. I have 
99.9% of my teachers, they did not get educated here. They didn't get their degrees from here. They got them from 180 different countries around the world. So when they come to me from 180 different countries, they come with different qualifications, different religions, different ethnicities, different cultures, different everything. And now they have got to go and be in a front of a class. If the class has 25, very likely that they have got 18 different nationalities in it. So I've got teachers from all over. They are teaching students from all over. So how to maintain this minimum bits that I need? So we are thinking that the teacher licensing, in a way, is like the little melting pot where people, they are remolded into the shape of Dubai, into what we want in this country. So this is the, the, the other bit, it is a standardization part. So we are basically standardizing teachers. So this is our minimum expectations because in different countries, people, they have got different expectations of their teachers. So let's just make sure that everybody understand what the expectation is. Okay, so what we did in, in order to do this, we say, okay, we are going to develop a teacher standards. And the standards that we have developed, it took us over two years to do that. And it is a national, it's not a Dubai, it is UAE. So ADEC in Abu Dhabi, Ministry of Education, and KHDA, they met together, meeting took over two years until we sign a common standard. Now these standards, they are based upon competency standards. So the difference between competencies and objective standards is that they have to be competencies, they have got to be demonstrated. They have got to be measured. They have got to be evidenced. So somebody has got to evidence that the teacher has these competencies. The difference between these standards and qualifications, if I take a B.Ed. in India, for instance, the B.Ed. in India is given by hundreds of different institutions. Yes? Most of them, they come from tens of different states. Each state has its own regulation. There is no single body in India that says a B.Ed. has got to be that. There is no quality assurance body that says they are meeting the minimum requirement. Okay? And there is no framework of competencies that a teacher should meet. So what you will find, and especially with the rise of a private higher education, there are so many universities and not just India, all around the world, that are catering for this escalation of qualification business, where now a degree has become, is not really an employment requirement, but a social requirement. Everybody wants a degree, okay? Now, even in certain Arab countries, when you go on to get engaged to a lady, they say, does he have a degree or not? And if he doesn't, they give him the big E. Okay, because he doesn't have the degree. So a degree has become a social requirement. And to cater for the social requirement, so many private institutions, they are catering for it to a standard of quality that's highly questionable. Okay, so for us, this highly questionable degrees and qualification and so on, when they come and work here, you cannot tell people your qualification is rubbish, your qualification is lousy, your qualification, this is not on. Because that will be, you need a lot of evidence to prove that their qualification does not meet your requirement. But there is another way of doing it. You will say, I have these requirements, and there are other ways of you meeting them. So we don't go into the business of judging 10,000 qualifications, but into the business of judging what this person is able to do. It's the competency. So the qualifications are fine. People, they need them. Okay, maybe they need them personally, maybe they need them socially, maybe they need them to do a certain thing. But at the end of the day is, what are you capable of? Same thing with the school leadership. Is basically we look at, are they strategic leaders? 
Are they educational leaders? Are they capable of running the operations at the school? And it doesn't mean that the principal has to be the accountant and the marketing and the HR, no. It means are they capable of overseeing this operation? Do they actually understand what goes on inside their schools? Or are they just figureheads? Or are they just administrator, administrators making sure that they sign the checkbook on behalf of the owners? Okay, so what are they? Are they custodian of the school? Or are they leaders of the school? And we want school leaders, we don't want school administrators, we don't want school custodians. So we want principals and headship that have a lot of clout, that can give advice to their teachers, that actually have a vision for their own school and where they want it to go. That they can go to the board of governors or the board of trustees and argue their own point and their own decision. Not be subservient and just do what they are told. So we are looking for a different breed of leaders. Okay, and that's what will help us go along. So, examples of the standard. The standards are built like this. For instance, on the teacher standard three, where it talks about professional practice, it's one of them says, promote positive learning environment, okay? So, for, this is an element. The element is made up of a number of performance criteria. The performance criteria, basically, how are we gonna measure if they can promote the positive learning environment or not. So to promote learning environment, they can create high quality learning environment, okay, that is safe, supportive, and motivating for learners. So this is the type of evidence that we look for. What sort of things that they can do to provide this evidence is, let's say, organize the classroom and its facilities to ensure physical safety, okay, comfort and emotional security of learners. All of this, when you look at it, is heavily loaded. It, it's not just the way it looks. Because when you look at, let's say, create a high quality learning environment that is safe, supported, and motivating for learners. It means the teacher has to know, they have to know, now this is knowledge. They have to know what is a quality learning environment? How do you create it? How do you make it safe? How do you motivate students? So here is where you are learning a lot of the theories. And theories in education are extremely important. There is no longer relying on this intuitive ability of somebody to teach well. Is the theories of learning, theories of education, they are the result of toil and investment of people all their lives investigating certain issues. And at the end of the day, they will formulate it, they will frame it into a theory. So for us to learn it, we may learn it in a day, but people, they have spent a lifetime and maybe generations formulating it. So for somebody just move into teaching and assume, oh, I know my math, I can teach my math. The assumption is no longer correct, okay? So, but then there is something else we need to also see that the teacher not only know about how to do it, not only know how to cook, but they can actually cook. You know, like when you are sitting and driving and you have got the backseat driver telling you what to do all the time? They can know, they will tell you about it, but they don't know how to drive, okay? So then you stop the car to one side and say, go ahead and drive. They don't even have a license. Okay, so you have to be very careful. It's not just knowing, but it's actually being able to do. So for school leaders, the question is a little bit more. So when we talk about educational leadership, this is only one of the elements. There are actually 99 different things in here that we need to look at. When we look at demonstrating knowledge of curriculum, it means now it is the duty of the school leader to understand the nuts and bolts of their own curriculum. No longer they are just have got somebody, the second in command and the third of command, that they know what the curriculum is. Here they have got to know. So if you are a school leader running two or three different curriculums, IB, Indian, and, and UK, you really got to understand all of them. You have got to understand what they are all about, what their objectives, what is their outcomes, what are the different challenges with the students, how the students are doing in each one. So you really have got to know the ins and out of it. 
Nobody says you have got to know all the chemistry and all the biology and all the arts. No, that's too much. But you have got to know overall what the curriculum is all about. So that's in a way. So basically, these standards, they have got certain features. They are, first of all, they are benchmarked against international standards. They are not standalone. We did not just make them here. They are focused on improvements. They are, they are quality initiative. They are not there to punish people, but they are there to make sure that everybody raise their level to meet this minimum requirement, okay? And they are evidence-based. So everything is based on evidence. It's not about objectives. It's not about knowing. It's not about just pieces of paper. It's about demonstrating these abilities in the school. And they are all developmental. They are all about raising the standards, growing up, changing all the time. If I, I met uh, quite a number of math teachers, biology teachers, art teachers, who they told me, math hasn't changed in the last 100 years. It's the same theory. What am I teaching at the schools? So why should I? I mean, what am I going to update myself in what? It's not about the content. It's about the people that you are delivering to. People have changed. Ways have, it's not about technology either, because this technology just come and go. And always be very wary of technology, because technology is the language of the salesperson. Always somebody trying to, tell, to sell you something. And once you buy it, how many software do you have at your schools? How many hardwares that you have that are based on technology that nobody uses? They are just misspent resources. They are there only for show. In reality, you have to be very wary because you need to have robust technology. You need to have real technology. You don't need to have just any technology. So every time the salesperson tell you, oh, now everybody is going to be taught by robotics, you know, by a robot, take it with a pinch of salt because it's not going to happen and you will all be, and your children will be in the jobs of teaching for the next 500 years. Okay, because why? Just like everything else. I remember in 1995, uh, when Amazon first came and so on, they said in 10 years time, all of these big shops, they will close down. And instead, they haven't closed down, they have become bigger and bigger. Yeah, Amazon got bigger, but everything gets bigger because us, we want the experience. We don't want to be stuck in front of machines. And it's the same for everyone. So just be careful with this technology bit, okay? But we want to have our leadership aligning itself. Uh, you know, it's a sort of it becomes organically aligned with the different curriculums. So it's not curriculum biased, okay? So whichever curriculum it is, it will organically align itself with it. And the evidence has to evolve. So we put the standards, we sign up to the standard. If you need copies of the standard, I've got Mokta here. Where is Mokta? There is Mokta, okay? And give her your card. She will send you a copy of the standard for you. She, she can share with you, okay? See, this is the way to collect cards, okay? Now, and so what we did, we then we said, will they work, will they not work? Let's pilot them. So the first thing we did in the piloting, we compared what we have with international licensing around the world. And we said, okay, so what are the main features of the Australian and New Zealand, Irish, and so on and this? I'm sure there must be maybe 10, 20 other licenses around the world that we did not look at. I mean, yeah, I've seen a license come to me from Barbados, but how many teachers do I have from Barbados? Okay, so if there is anybody that has got a license from any other system, by all means, submit it to us. We will study it, and we will see whether it's the same. Does it benchmark or it doesn't benchmark? And then we can say. But we try to align Dubai with all the international system because this is where we want to be. So it's an aspiration. And this is the direction that we are going in to the year 2021. Okay, so. Okay. Now, I'm not sure, am I doing this or somebody else is doing it for me? Okay, so, good. So, in, the, in, in this uh, 
piloting, we had 15 Dubai school participating, and we also had one teach best institution. Basically, this is for aspiring teachers. The laws have always been, if you want to be in the teaching profession in Dubai, you need two years experience. Good, very good. So, but nobody ever told me how these two years experience are contributing to the quality of the teacher. Because very often, I'm getting teachers with two bad years of experience that they should not have had this two years of experience. And then the most important thing is people are asking why Emiratis are not teachers? Of course, you want two years experience? Where are they going to get it if they have not worked before? So they come to you, we don't allow them to teach because they don't have two years experience. So this has gone. So now a lot of new thinking that has come about that. So this two years experience, I have got thousands of potentially good teachers for the future in Dubai. They are spouses. Why not tap into them and bring them into the education system rather than saying to everybody, you don't have two years, thank you, sit down. Okay, they are there, there is already the talent. So these are the ones. Now, apparently, they have volunteered, okay? So I'm not sure how right this statement is. So these people, when we said to the licensing, we said, okay, let's look at them before we license them, and let's look at basically three aspects. Is, do they have a teacher preparation qualification? And out of my 224, 50% did not have a teacher preparation qualification. It means they went into teaching by knowing a subject. And that's the problem. The more you become subject focused, you just become regurgitation focused. You are not, education is not about growing the mind. Education is about knowing more stuff. What to do with it, that's immaterial, okay? I'm sure all of you, if I give you your secondary school exam again now, okay, uh, you know, I'm not sure how well you will do, okay? Right? How, how, who who thinks they are going to pass their secondary examination again? Anybody? You think you will pass all the subjects? Maybe only the subject that you teach, not all of them. Okay? But that's the problem. We, we are so focused on passing exams and so on, but we are not focusing on the cognitive development. Okay? So it has to be much more developing the mind, much more education is about transforming people, the transformation rather than just the knowledge bit. So we looked at, okay, so these guys are teaching in English. So again, what do you think would be the minimum IELTS requirement for somebody to teach in the language of, you know, English? Seven? Okay, seven. The, I hear some people say nine, some people say seven, some people say six. 7.5? So most of the time, when I ask people, the majority, let's say, would say around about seven. When we applied seven, I only got less than 80. So can you imagine, out of the two, two, four teachers teaching in English, okay, only a third of them, they had a seven. When I went to 6.5, I had roughly 130 teachers. When I went to six, I had 180 teachers. So, you know, what does that tell you? It tells you I've got loads of teachers in schools who are unable to articulate, who are unable to explain the conceptually, they don't really understand. They may know bits of knowledge, but they will fail to understand the concept because a level six does not allow you to understand concepts. You may regurgitate whatever knowledge you have read. You may understand the mechanical aspect of solving a problem, but you don't really get it. That's another problem I have. The third problem is we had an exam, and the exam basically looks at the how to teach rather than the subject part. And when we tried a 70% pass rate, I got less than 80 people passing again. And when I got a 60% pass rate, I got only close to 150. So when I put 55%, I got 186. It's a pilot, so I am working with things. I'm not sure what I should do. So when you look out of the 224, the only people that got actually licensed 
was half of them. Now, I have two problems here. One problem is I have lowered the standards below a certain point. Another problem is these people that came into the pilot, they must have been the creme de la creme of the schools. They are not the ordinary average teachers. They are the better teachers. So you can see where the fix that we have, okay? So, so this is the fix, how to go forward with it. You know, what are we going to do? So for the teacher licensing, what we will do basically is we start at a point where we are meeting with the different schools. Already in the month of November, uh, I personally met with 135 different schools. Uh, on Wednesday, I will be meeting with another 40 schools. This Wednesday, they all come together. And from each school, I get a principal and plus somebody else. And if people are interested in to come into this meeting, again, Mokta, remember this name? Okay. So, basically, during the day, we, it's a four hours meeting. We disseminate the requirement for how are we doing the licensing and then for teachers. And then the second portion is how we are licensing principals. If you come from Sharjah, Abu Dhabi, other Emirates, that will not pertain to you. They may have a different system. <clears throat> so this is very much a Dubai way of licensing. Okay? There might be similar aspects, but this is Dubai. And that's why we keep, okay, you can see there, Dubai. So don't get confused by going to your authority if you are outside Dubai and by saying, oh, but they, Dr. Naji said that. Nothing to do with me, okay? So focus, if you are Dubai, this is the way. <coughs> so basically, how, how, how did this happen? Okay. Oh, okay, fine. So once we meet with the school, because in Dubai, what we are doing, we are saying, we are really trying to transfer all of this licensing back to the school. So the school have to take the lead. So the school have to create a school plan for the licensing. So over the next four years, how they are going to license their own stuff. Once they do that, and they sent us, they nominate the teachers for this year, then the teachers, they will have to submit an application. Now, the application form, it's highly reflective. The teacher has to write about themselves. Not about what they will do, but about what they have done. So it's, it's more to do with what they have done. And once they do that, and they satisfy minimum requirements, then we issue them a provisional license. The provisional license life is one year, nominally. But it can go up to two years, depending on the different circumstances. And during the time of the provisional license, they have to complete compulsory training. And compulsory training, there are six courses that any teacher, leader, librarian, social worker working at a school in Dubai has to complete. Okay? And then they can go for the teacher standard exams, and there are a set of four exams. And having finished that, they can go for a subject exam. The subject exam, if you want to teach math, you take the math. You want to teach math and physics, you will have to do the math and physics. You want to do math, physics, and biology, then you will have to take the three exams. Depending, if you are teaching the primary years, you take primary years exam. Okay, so it depends what a teacher will do. If you are teaching Arabic, you will have to take the Arabic exam. If you are teaching uh, history, geography, and so on, you will have to take the humanities exam. So it depends what, what you do. And then people that will submit what we call a mini portfolio, and the mini portfolio basically it's a reflective report, as well as a performance report written by the principal of the school about the teacher. Now that performance report is basically, is, it goes two ways. It's what is the judgment of the school about their teacher, but we use it to evaluate the leadership and the principal of the school. So the weaker that report becomes, it is an indication of the level of leadership that we have within the school. 
Okay? So somebody will ask me, oh, does that mean I have got a school of 300 teachers? Do I have to write a single report about each one? No. Maybe that report will be helped to write, but every report has to be signed by you, which means you, as a principal, you have oversight of all the reports. And then once I get four reports written by four different people for you, and each one, one going right, one going left, one so on, I know you are not doing your job, and you are not having a proper oversight. So it means the direction has to come from the principal, the responsibility and accountability with the principal, it could be written by somebody else. So that's basically it, and then people, they will have competence. So for the leadership, not yet. Okay, yes? I already talked about the standard. There are four sets of standards. If you want, write an email. Mokta will send you what the standards are. You will see what the exams are, okay? Uh, we even got uh, sample questions. We got a lot of things. Okay, so for, for leadership license, it's slightly different. For existing school leaders or existing principals, basically what they do, they complete an application, and then the application they will, go, will undergo an assessment because this application has a lot of questions that are reflective in nature. People, they talk about themselves and what they have achieved. Then it is basically we issue them a provisional license. Then they will have to do the compulsory training like everybody else. And then there will be a principal license examination. And then a leadership project, because this is the key for the leaders. So once they get the, the provisional license, they'll have to undertake an improvement project at the school. It is up to 12 months project, where at the end they have to submit their project and they have to show what the school improvement they have done. This is a little bit like the NPQH, if you are familiar with it. And then, of course, they will have to do, once they do the licensing and the leadership, okay, the examination and the leadership, then we look at the DSIB report, which is the inspector reports about the school and about the role of the principal in it, and then they get a competent license. For new ones, for people that are coming new into, into becoming a principal, we, they, we get the school to nominate them, then we do a CV review, and then we do a qualification check, but then, unlike before, where they only came for an interview, now they come for a whole day, an assessment day. Basically, they come to an assessment center where they are given different scenarios, they have to work on them, and they are interviewed at the end of the day before we tell the school yes or no. And then they go through the same thing all over. Okay. So, there are basically six pillars when we are licensing. So the first pillar we ask ourselves, is the teacher or principal, do they have appropriate qualifications? And the name appropriate qualification is very important. It means are they appropriately qualified to take the role that they want to take? So the second one, is the teacher or principal, okay, proficient in the language of instruction? So. A principal would require a minimum of seven, a teacher a minimum of six. But over the next six years, the teachers then they will move into 6.5, and by the year 2000, and God knows what, it's going to be about seven, okay? So the third question we say, we ask ourselves, is the teacher or principal are of good standing? It means this, you know, whether it's police report or child protection certificates and so on, they have to be produced. And the next one we ask ourselves, is the teacher or a principal, has the teacher or the principal com competent, okay, in these six areas. The six areas are, which is the child protection, dealing with people with determination, with special needs, that's the second one. The third one is moral education. The third, fourth one is positiveness and well-being. The fifth one is diversity, and the sixth one is sustainability. So these are the six courses that have to be completed. And they have got to be completed with an assessment. It's not just, you know, it's buddies on seats. It has to be a little bit more than that. The next one is, is the teacher or principal capable of demonstrating that they, the professional competencies and subject knowledge 
which means through the examinations and through the subject exam. Finally, is the teacher or principals, okay, they are capable of reflecting and demonstrating a professional practice. So these are the best, you know, the six pillars that we use for this. Okay. So how will we do it? So basically for the teachers, our objective is to have 25% every year. Of course, some schools, they may beat this and they may even do some more. So every year we will have from January 2018, 25%, that's the first cohort. Second cohort will be another 25, it will become 50. Third cohort will go 75. Fourth cohort will have 100%. So we are gonna get the 100% of teachers on PTL. For principals, it's gonna be slightly different in Dubai. All principals of all schools are gonna be licensed from January 2018. It applies to all of them, okay? Why? Because once a principal is licensed, it means they can lead the school, okay? Teacher licensing and then later on leadership licensing. Vice principals, they will come in the second year and other school leadership. So, what are the benefits? We think they are huge. They are huge for investors. They are huge for providers. Uh, for the providers, it means there will be a lot of opportunities to develop training courses, to develop even university courses for the teacher licensing. It's not only in Dubai. At the moment, I've got a catchment of 20,000 teachers. By the year 2021, this catchment will go up to 30,000 with the expansion, the number of schools and the chain and so on. Over all the country, we could be talking about 120,000 teachers altogether. So there is a lot of opportunity. For school, of course, this is what it's all about. The crunch is enhanced outcomes. That's what we want. We want to meet our targets. And for aspiring teachers, people who are, want to be a teacher, now finally we have opened an avenue for them, okay? For existing teachers, of course, this is huge for them because this is an investment in oneself for principals too. Once you get the Dubai license, it means your mobility into other countries with the brand of Dubai, with the quality of Dubai, okay? It means, and with our license being benchmark, again, the best in the world, it's an added plus to everyone. Now, a lot of people are scared of this. They say, oh, licensing, will they kick me out of my job? What happened if I fail? What happened of this? I think, think, rewind, go back to the starting point. This is a quality initiative. This is a development initiative. No one is going to be kicked out of school. Just simply, some people, they will be able to do it faster than others. But they will do it. They will do it. You can't be a teacher in a classroom expecting your student to pass and to learn and to engage and to do and to do. And you yourself is not willing to. Okay? because it's all about learning. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, unless I've overrun. Uh, no, just for a minute. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Naji Al-Mahdi, Chief. Qualifications and awards in KSD Dubai. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was an enriching and learning experience for all of us. And you have shared with us the vision of uh, Dubai's education spectrum, especially uh, when it comes to ensuring quality education being imparted to students, the teachers and the school ecosystem as a whole. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I request Mr. Amit Sharma from government of, uh, from India, who is part of JNK government, to come on stage and kindly present the souvenir to Dr. Naji El Mahadi, Chief KSDA, uh, Chief Qualification Awards KSDA Dubai. A big round of applause for Dr. Naji El Mahadi. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And you know the magazine also. Yeah. Thank you.